This is Ash from All Things Dentistry. Welcome to the place where we're passionate about those hints and tips in dentistry. And if you're new here, take a look around. We've got a whole bunch of stuff from many years of learning stuff from friends and colleagues and mentors. And today we've got a really special case. This is Patrick. Patrick is a, he served 35 years, 30, 35 years. So we're grateful for his service. And he presented a few, uh, almost a week ago, just with pain to his lower right posterior quadrant. So it it turns out that tooth number four, six, and four, seven had these beautiful zirconia crowns placed on them approximately five years ago. And today we're going to be doing a root canal on one of them. Um, it turns out it's probably number four, six. Well, it is number four, six. Uh, his chief complaint or his symptoms, sorry, his history was that he was having aching, kind of throbbing pain to hot and cold, biting pain. And so he was having a hard time to sleep. So let's go ahead and take a look at the clinical exam that we did. So first off, I'm going to do is we're going to do palpation, just palpating the, the buccal mucosa and in the vestibule. We're going to palpate along the lingual, lingual surface of the, uh, the mandible. Pretty quick. No pain at all. Everything looks good. We're going to do our probing depths now. We're just looking for um, any type, oh, it's a different case, any types of, you know, essentially really what I'm looking for is any bleeding and probing, any generalized deep probing depths, fairly brief, but I'm also looking for any type of deep probing depth that might indicate a cracked tooth. So this tooth is still vital based on his symptoms. We're going to find out in a second. Next, we're going to do some lateral percussion. So I've started, my buddy Reagan told me to talk to me about lateral percussion. I haven't found anywhere in the literature that talks about it. Uh, but it does, so he was symptomatic on that lateral percussion on the 4-6. And then what I'm going to do is, if you take a look here, let's just wind back here one sec. So what I do is, I've kind of done this because my mirror handle has slipped off single cusp tips, teeth, so many times that now what I do is I use my thumb on my hand, my other hand that's not holding the handle, holding the mirror to guide, like a guiding plane. So you can see here, it just kind of guides it. Not so much there. The implant's not going to do much. He does have pain on the 4.6 and no pain on the 4.7. So we're going to finish off um, this part of the clinical exam just with a cold test. So let me speed that up because he might be here for a little while. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to place cold endo ice on a cotton pellet. We'll slow down here. And then we're going to see, you know, what happened was he got a really slow, I got a really slow delayed response, but it did linger. You can see him say yes. And I was kind of like, well, maybe the cotton pellet's warm. So on the 7, and the other issue was that we're going through a zirconia crown. So my positive control for this, if you can call it that, the other crown, let's, let's just do it in my own words, the other tooth with the zirconia crown on it did respond to cold. So that gives me an idea like, okay, well, at least we're getting some transmittance of thermal, uh, our thermal tests. So we're going to keep going. We're going to redo the 4.6, and it does take a really long time before we get a light response uh, with a linger. So we'll go ahead and give him local anesthesia and we'll do that. So next, let's head on to the next video here. And just one second while I reset. Okay, so here we go. Let's do this, so we, I'm gonna try this. This is a new thing I'm learning. Boom. Right there. All right. So you can tell, let's take a look at this x-ray, this radiograph just before we see it. We've got a radiograph of two number four, six or 30. And we've got a zirconia crown on here. We've got, um, we don't have any PDL widening. And you wouldn't expect that in such a symptomatic case because we diagnosed the case as tooth number four, six with symptomatic irreversible pulpitis with symptomatic able peritonitis. Um, we've got a kit for the calcified canal, uh, but we've got pretty open canals, calcified pulp chamber, let's say that with fairly open canals. So, you know, once we get in here, we should be good to go. And I can tell you that we were. So we did a bit of a shift shot just to help us. And when I see this little calcification, I'm thinking, I'm always thinking two canals in the distal. One of the most missed canals is a distal canal. So let's go ahead, you know, right here. You see that? It's, it's hard to see, but you can see I'm placing cold. So after I gave him three blocks, I give my standard is three blocks just to make sure we cover everything. Um, and then I'm going to cold test. So patient said, yeah, my, my lip is numb, but I don't usually believe that. I'm going to go ahead and I'll do a cold test. And if we still have, if he still feels a cold test, then we're going to give another block, but I'll also do a PDL injection. And then 
down the road of a true intraosseous. But we got lip, uh, we were cold test negative. So we're going to place in our, um, our rubber bite block. If you've never used one of these, I encourage you to use one. Gaggers don't like them, but um, most people do, and they're really helpful. So we're going to place our rubber dam right on there. And then we're going to place our opal dam, our secondary seal. I've kind of, honestly, I've shied away from this now. We're just going to go straight with Aura seal. This is like curable, this opal dam, but honestly, it flicks off. You'll see throughout the video, it flicks off. And I'm kind of, I'm kind of tired of that. <clears throat> After six years, I think I've done my due diligence of testing it. So Aura seal is great because it's some sort of silicate based material and it stays on there. So, you know, let's just take a look at this. This is a zirconia crown. This is actually zirconia burr. If you want to know the name brand, I have no idea what it is, but I can message my dental assistant Dana and she can let us know. Um, that's a pretty solid, pretty solid crown. And, you know, we're hitting below, you know, I mean, essentially we're going to be, the pulp tumor is going to be below kind of where the margin is. So let's go ahead and honestly, <clears throat> it was slow going, but I'll tell you the beauty of, um, I'm an advocate 100% advocate of electric hand pieces. If you have never tried one, they're heavy. They are can be heavy. They can be bulky. Probably the technology is changing, but I'll tell you, it's got the torque to rip through this. So I'm slowly trying to make a buckle lingual slot, and then I make it into like a square right in the center of the tooth. But it's pretty slow going. But the beauty of the electric hand piece is that it just keeps on going. It doesn't stall out. Uh, of course, this is a brand new burr, and I burn the burr out by the end of uh, the procedure. Um, but, you know, we're making our way. This is in real time, so I'm not speeding it up. At some point, I'm going to get pretty bored here. This is round. This is actually take three of this video, so I'm trying to make it shorter. Okay, so we're getting closer down to pulp tissue. Um, what's really interesting is that the occlusal height of this crown was actually three millimeters in one section and six in another. So it was almost like... Um, there was a large, some sort of restoration and they just did a quick prep and on it went. So with regard, I'm not sure how the resistance retention form worked, but I'll tell you for five years, this has been on there and hopefully my vibration didn't knock it off in the past week. I know it didn't knock it off the day after because I called him and he was, uh, he was out of pain. So we relieved his symptoms. So let's take a look here. We're still making our way. I'm still trying to make a larger preparation, uh, but it is again, slow going and I didn't realize at the time, but when my buddy Majid rolled in, <clears throat> this is at his practice. I do his endo. He's a prosthodontist. I, he, once he rolled in, he's like, how's it going? I'm like, well, check out the thickness of this. And then as we started measuring, uh, it comes out to be like six millimeters in the distal lingual. I'm like, man, I wonder why it's so slow. Uh, but we're slowly making our way down. I am using, I am gauging the depth. I know that the, the cutting, not the cutting flutes, but the diamond portion of that burr is 10 millimeters long. So there we are, and now you can see this is some sort of sclerotic calcified remineralized tooth structure that was carious. If you if you know if you have the proper name for black dentin, let me know what it is. Um, I just know that we'll stick to it because it's a good indicator of where I need to go. So I'm looking kind of you know one of the things that you need to be perspective you know one of the the rules I've tried to beat is the first canal. This is one of the tips I've learned a long time ago. The first canal you're going to hit into is the mesolingual. And the reason why is because the angulation of the tooth is this way in the mandible. And you're coming straight in like this. And it just, even though I angle the burr this way, it's always going to be the mesolingual. And our, look at our rubber dam clamp. It looks like it's perpen makes this tooth look perpendicular, even though this angle it isn't. You can see that angle, but I'm telling you, trust me, I've tried to break that rule, but it doesn't work. So I thought I'd be really fancy and take my six file and go ahead and try to get in there but I'm nowhere near like nowhere near where we need to go so what I'm going to do is we're going to use a round burr our slow round burr on our months hand piece or a months burr so let's zoom in there so this is a slow round burr it's a number one this is a one millimeter diameter burr you can't see it's out of focus and it's really long shank it's 31 millimeters in this burr and the beauty of it it's got a long thin shank so I can see what the heck I'm doing so I don't use any air. I get my dental assistant to blow air into the... I don't use any water. I get the dental assistant, uh, Dana, to blow air. Hopefully this stays in focus. There was a little bit, of, unfortunately, as I was, as I sped it up, there was some... Uh, as I hit the gas on the burr, there was some irrigant that came flying out of there. But essentially what I'm doing is I'm making a path 
from buccal to lingual and trying to figure out in the distal there. Now I'm not going right down the middle of the tooth, but I'm trying to keep stay at the corners of this preparation because I know I'm looking for, uh, let's see here, that's gonna be a mesial, uh, it's hard to see in the mirror. So a mesial lingual, mesial buccal. So I'm looking for a mesial lingual. Let's see here, this is mesial buccal there, mesial lingual. So I'm looking for mesial lingual, which is gonna be right around here. So we're gonna be looking for a transition in the color. Now I really apologize in advance because this video was way out of focus for, <clears throat> not all of it, uh, maybe 5%. But you can see here, I'm not zoomed in, but this is kind of the, the key that I'm looking for right there. See that darkness? So this is what I tend to believe is calcification. This right here, we're starting to get into some good either sclerotic dentin, some mineralized dentin, uh, mineralized pulp chamber, my apologies, sclerotic pulp chamber, pulp tissue. And I'm going to kind of trough away. I'm not placing apical pressure. I'm just doing a brushing technique. It's almost like you're brushing your teeth, just brushing away the plaque. And if you're talking to kids, you're brushing away the sugar bugs. So I'm doing a nice light brushing. Uh, and we don't want to go apical in this type of technique, like straight down, like digging holes straight down. We want to go lateral and we want to do a nice, again, brushing the plaque off your teeth technique, uh, just to kind of remove some of that dentin, mineralized pulp chamber tissue. And there we are, we're getting closer. Let's take a look. So the next stage is to use uh, an explorer. I recommend a super sharp one, not the dull ones that I've been using for my entire career. So I'm going to place apical pressure and see if we get in that little dot. I can't remember if that's it. I place apical pressure around that area. So I know that I'm in the ballpark and I'm looking for that mesiolingual because I know that, oh, I think that was it. Boom. I think I zoom in here. Yeah, that's it right there. So I broke through the surface of where we are kind of right here probably. Let's zoom in. You can see a little bit of, so one of the beautiful things I love about his microscope, it's a really expensive Leica um, compared to my more economical globals is that you can zoom in and it pretty much stays in focus throughout the zoom. Now the beauty, what I'll see is that you see that it becomes like a liquid, very shiny. When I see that and not pure a bloodstream, I know the bloodstream would indicate that I perfed. Uh, but when I see that nice little shiny fluid, I'm like, yep, that's it. Boom. Down goes that file. So we're kind of fishing that six file in there. But that tells me that I'm either, you know, most likely I'm near the orifice. There's not a lot of pulp to, like if you look at the x-ray over here while you're doing that, um, it, I'm testing you to see if you can do two things at once. Um, you know, you kind of look, it's not going to be really the pulp chamber we're in. We're kind of more in that orifice, kind of pulp horn area. So I'm happy with that. I zoom in just to kind of get a nice view of that. Because it is actually fairly exciting. I mean, we are doing root canals. There's nothing more exciting in the world than doing this. So we're in, in that case, <clears throat> excuse me. So what we're going to be doing now is, so now we can triangulate what we're doing. So we kind of know that, you know, if this is, you know, we've got to remember that this, this crown may not be perfectly centered on the tooth. And the tooth might be rotated. I don't see a lot of rotation in this tooth. So, um, but I have been burned before by assuming that the tooth is not rotated. So I'm going to assume that the other orifice is going to be somewhere under here, but I'm also going to be triangulating, trying to find where the distal orifice is. So that's what's going through my head right now. We're going to remove, so all this material here is safe material to move, remove. And likely what I need to go is right there where that mineralized pulp tissue is. It's kind of stained dark. And keep kind of troughing this way, not go deep down that way. Because you will, I mean, you'll find something, probably bifurcation. And now I come out of focus. So let's go ahead and fast forward here. So there we go. So now we're going to take our Munzburr again. And we're just going to trough nice and light. I may actually, sometimes I try to remove some of that calcified tissue as well. Let's go ahead and hit play. Just to kind of get it a better... Just get a better feel. I mean, I'm just brushing, like I'm removing a thin layer of, a nice little thin piece of paper off the pulp chamber floor. So these things right there, this little thing I look at, I'm like, oh, maybe that's, you know, that's a junction between something that where it collects dust. Maybe that's something. 
and I'm just making my way. Oh, let me see here if I can find it. And what you're noticing, I don't know if you notice it, but what I'm seeing is that I can't tell what the heck is what. So at some point, I need to change the color by adding liquid, some water. She's blowing air, but I'll add water to this to kind of, you know, let bring the colors and pop them. You know, pop the colors, just like a new, a new painted cupboard. So the colors pop, or a new painted room, or whatever painting that pops that you can think of. But it's amazing that when you change the color of Denton, um, add water, how it changes the color. So I'm looking more in the distal right now. I'm trying to place... I know that when I take a look at the x-ray that's up at uh, on the monitor, I know that if I found this one, this one's going to be a little bit lower. So I'm going to have to have a little more a little more judicial removal of that sclerotic pulp tissue. So I might actually have done it. I can't remember. Let's just see what happens. It's like I'm watching. I just did this. I just did this recap yesterday. I'm redoing it now. Boom. I think we're in. Did we get the little gloss? But I felt a little pull. Uh, well, I didn't feel one. I just saw it look like it's stuck. Let's go ahead and back and see if we can get a file in there. And I don't know. I can't remember if I get it in or not. I don't think so. But I'm super close. <clears throat> you know, maybe I'm like right there. So outcomes, it should be the Munzberg again, if I recall. We're just drying some saliva. There we go. All right, so let me go back here. Okay, so we're close. I mean, that little dot, it looks like it's starting to get wet, tells me that we're in the right location. I'm going to try again with another file. Sorry, it's at the bottom of the screen. There we go. Let's zoom out. So let's take a look here. It's wetted. So it's hard to see in the camera, but in real life, it actually pops. You can see how this is all dark now versus this being white. So that gives me an idea that, yeah, we're getting close. Uh, kind of darkish here. That's white. Don't go there. Don't go there. Um, well, we know where we are there already. So I'm going to take my months bird, do a little more judicial removal of that uh, sclerotic pulp tissue. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start trying to find it more in the distal lingual corner. Now, one of the key things, actually, I just thought about this. In, uh, in my residency, they were talking about, you know, a good place to place pins. I know that you almost probably jumped up, fell off your seat talking about pins and restorations, especially amalgams, is that when there's a, a large restoration, usually that pulp chamber is calcified back. So you can safely find a spot to place your pin uh, you, if you graduated within the last, before the last 20 years, which um, I haven't. Um, you probably have never even seen a pin, but for us old timers, I'll crack it out once in a while. All right, so here we go. Now we're looking, you see these white dots? Those might be areas of Denton debris collection. So let's go ahead and take my non-sharp, which it should be sharp, Endo Explorer. Oh, look at that. Did you see that? Boom. I think that's it. Let me speed here. Let's get that file in there. Come on. No, I don't think it was. Oh, it wasn't. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, I don't know why I just did this, but uh, I'm going to look for the mesial buckle. No, I think I was in actually. I was like, yeah, we're good. I'm going to search for that mesial buckle. Yeah, let's say that. And okay, now maybe I wasn't in. More apical pressure. Sharp endo explorer would be more, much more helpful. I'll remember to get another one. So at this point, I'm kind of like, I'm at, I'm at a loss for the mesial buckle because I really need to straighten it out. So what I'm going to do, that's the beauty of endo is you can always change your access. I'm actually going to re remove more of the distal lingual, I think. And I'm going to definitely remove, so this is where I need to go. I would need to make this a little more straighter to get a little bit better because I know there's more something hiding under there I can access. And then... My mesial buckle, which is right here, I'm going to straighten that out a little bit more. So you can see I'm just whittling away with that. So you can see how now I've straightened it out a little more because it kind of came like this. So it gives me a little more flex, a little more flexing room just to come a little more distal and get a little more space. 
And right there, I think I'm working on the, no, I don't want any updates tonight. Thank you. I want my computer to work. Okay, so now I've troughed a little bit more for this mesial buckle. This is our mesial buckle. So I'm back to mesiolingual, mesial buckle, distal. Trying to search. I'm sorry it's out of focus. It's only like this for another little bit, and then we're back into focus. So at this point, <clears throat> here's this is a simple tip that may help you, may not. So I know that I've got my mesiolingual here. I've got it, my endo explorer in it. I usually just take my wave and go primer, it reciprocates, and I'm going to open up that orifice. I feel confident. I've been doing that for about three, 4,000 cases now. It works just like gold. My distal, I'm kind of like my hand file won't go down it, but you know what? I'm going to give it a shot. Worst off, it, you know, worst off, it doesn't do anything. And lo and behold, boom, I find it. That is like the best feeling. I mean, there's a lot of best feelings, but that one, when you're in the middle of doing endo and it's been 20 minutes, you're still trying to find uh, orifices, it's a great feeling. So that's two spots. And then, so we got that. This here, what I'm doing right now, this is just like make me feel good. Like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm in. That's all that is. Now we got to find this mesial buckle. So I'm going to triangulate. So I know that there's a mesiolingual here. I know there's a distal. I'm looking, I'm still trying to figure out if there's two of them or a ribbon. Uh, but then I'm looking for my mesial buckle. So here we are again. Now what I'm doing is, you know, I'm, it's kind of like one of those, like I'm just going to give up and try something different right now. I'm going into the distal. I'm trying to clean out that distal lingual portion to see if I can get, because now I know there's an orifice there, but I'm also trying to see if I can get more opening with that distal lingual. And at the same time, you see how I'm angling it? This way, I'm trying to angle it. Uh, that's the problem with electric hand pieces. It's actually fairly large. I, I could switch it to my uh, my connect hand piece by eight teeth. I've been using that. It's cordless. It's incredible. It's such a small head. You'll see at the end um, or even soon. I switch that out, and it's a much smaller head, so I can actually get that in there. Okay, so now we're finding stuff. We're getting a little bit closer. There's a whole bunch of dentin stuff in there. Placing a lot of apical pressure. And you can see where I'm, I'm looking. So the original orifice that I found was here. And you can see using the law of symmetry from Krasner Rankow, there are, if this is the mesial buckle, mesial buckle, mesial lingual, mesial lingual, mesial buckle, and distal, the other distal canals here. So I'm gonna make sure that I'm finding something over there because we don't wanna leave any tissue in order to potentially fail our case. All right, so, oh, that's a great feeling right there. So that's what I thought I saw. So when I took my Explorer, I'm just going backwards here. I took my Explorer, I placed apical pressure. Boom, there's a little stick right there. Right there, right there. So that tells me that, okay, we're good. I'm gonna flick, actually down the road, you'll see a stone come flying out of there on that distal. So I'm gonna use my, so watch the curve on my file. So I place a curve on there. Let's see if I can get a better curve. And then I'm going to place that right in that little orifice. This is not for the fainted heart. And then we're going to work our way down and open up that orifice. That's a beautiful feeling, getting a little bit of dent and debris on your apical flutes. All right, so it's time to get some hypo down here. We're using full strength. We're using a side bended needle. I bend it at 18 millimeters, so I know exactly what I'm doing. And then I'm going to watch wine. So this is pretty boring. So I'm going to place my file into my orifice. So the key thing that I've been teaching, this is what we teach our, our, our uh, students, our new dentists, our residents, everybody. We teach them to open and up the coronal two thirds of this canal and then place a file. And I saw that just this morning, <clears throat> another case we sat in and helped them out. Instead of leaving pulp tissue in that coronal two thirds, get rid of it. Don't jam it apically. Get rid of it. It's not, it's a secret that's been around for years. <clears throat> Wave and Gold is beautiful for that. I don't get paid by Dentsply to say that because they don't pay me, nothing. I just love using that file. And you can see now we're into the orifice and we're going to watch line that file down. Now I don't think it actually goes anywhere. So that's the beauty of endo. Oh, maybe it did. Okay, so I'm going to take my apex locator, we'll place it on there and then see if we're in the ballpark. I actually don't think, yeah, keep going to the ballpark. 
So this is in the mesial buckle. Oh yeah, that's what happened. So so you see, actually what I had to do was move the rubber dam clamp back because it was in the way of the file. And I don't think I had any motion on this file. I wasn't very happy with it. So I did a little watch winding. Oh, I did. So we got our working length. This is really preliminary with a six file. So we'll pull that out. I had a really pretty smooth path, if I can recall. All right, so where are we now? This is now, this is the mesial buckle. You can see that curve. My apologies, the other one was the mesiolingual. There we go, mesial buckle. My sincerest apologies if I misled you. Okay, this, so there's a difference between the two canals. And usually the mesiolingual is straighter, but you see how that file, I'm gonna go backwards, just watch it go, ooh, watch wine all the way down, boom. There we go. That is makes it so much easier. And that's why I had confidence that once we got into this case, at least one of these canals would be pretty rock solid in terms of getting a working length. So I didn't even do any smoothies or nothing like that. So this is our distal canal and it's pretty straightforward too. Uh, down goes a six. And honestly, I've been using six files now for the last about five years, the first file, and it makes life 90% of the time much easier. So we're gonna irrigate with our full strength hypochlorite. And then we're going to go with our 10 file. Normally you go to a six, but this one seems, I mean, the music buckle just dropped. So there's our music buckle. Look how fast that was. That's like super speedy. It's like, it, honestly, I think I was standing across the room and I threw it in and it just fell down the, fell, <laughs> fell down the canal. So we got our working length. I can't remember what they are. Maybe let's say 20 millimeters. I'm gonna try a distal canal. Everything was pretty much the same. And then, we're gonna try our mesial lingual. Nope. So what we're doing again, so this is where it pays to not give up and try to find things, especially if you have high magnification. I'm still trying to make sure that we have that distal lingual corner. I'm not happy with it not being cleaned out because if there's pulp tissue in there, there's a high probability that if I miss that, this case is going to fail. So you can see here now, there's a mesial buckle, mesial lingual, and you see that circle in the middle. So it looks like now it's kind of, as we're moving more of that, this layer right here, it's actually becoming one canal. And you'll see I'll pop out actually a stone that was hiding, an attached dental stone or identical. I think it's like right there, boom. Uh, nope, not yet. I'm giving away the secret. So a little more troughing. Actually, what I'm troughing for here. So there are two things that are going through my mind as I'm watching this. One, I'm still troughing to figure out what's going on in the distal without opening it up too much. And I'm gonna be troughing the middle mesial between the two mesial canals, just to make sure we don't have a, an extra canal between the two. There we go. All right, so we're just finishing this. I do a good push, boom, look at that, just broke free. Now, you could argue that my time might have been actually much more efficiently utilized by using an ultrasonic handpiece, and I'd actually probably agree with you. I don't usually use an ultrasonic, I use Monspurs and old school stuff, but now and then, I do crack out the ultrasonic, it didn't have it for today, but that would have been particularly useful. See, and then look at that, there's the opal dam. I've given up on that stuff. Boom, and the suction gone. So we're gonna finish our working link, that's in the distal. <clears throat> we're going to irrigate lots, lots and lots and lots, and then we're going to start doing our cleaning and shaping. Let's speed this up because we don't need to watch any of this. This is get boring. So, what I'm doing here, let me just what I what I noticed after years of using this file is that if I pull the file out, let me slow it down. If I pull it, take the file down, pull it out, and shake it around in the irrigant in the pulp chamber, it empties the flutes automatically. It's a beautiful, speedy technique. Rather than bring a file out every time to clean it, now I've cleaned and, sh I've cleaned and shaped the mesial lingual just like that. Boom. We're going to go in the mesial buckle. Same thing. I'll bring it out a little bit, shake it off, take it back down. Bring it out a little bit, shake it off, bring it back down. And what I'm trying to do is twofold. I'm trying to take more of that irrigant down with me. But more importantly, I'm trying to empty those fluids because nothing in the world, even drill bits and wood, anything, Anything drilling does not cut when the flutes are filled. So you gotta keep cleaning those flutes. So I'm doing kind of a 
a one, two, kind of, I don't even know what I'm saying. Kind of like a, I go down for a second, pull out, irrigate, or clean out the flutes. And you can see here, all of our pulp chamber irrigant is filled with dentin, dentin mud, which is drying the, uh, and then we're going to do our distal. Ideally, I should have actually rinsed the canal, rinsed out the pulp chamber and the canals. But here we go, we're going to rinse it out anyways. So we've gotten a length on three of our canals. Let's go back here and see what we can see. So we've got our one distal. Now you can see it's straight down the middle. So we've removed all that excess. All of this stuff, we got rid of that to make sure that there wasn't an extra canal hiding. And we're right along the middle of the, of the two mesial orifices. So I'm happy, I guess I'm not, but I, in the end it becomes I'm happy uh, that there's not, not another orifice there. Another, not another canal there, it's just, it could be a ribbon. So we're doing our final funking around, making sure. Now what I'm doing here is I'm actually troughing between the two mesial canals looking for, I'm going to drop this dentin one millimeter below the pulp chamber floor and I'm going to be going, pushing more mesially to make, sh to make sure that we don't have a middle mesial canal. Another booby trap that could potentially fail our case. They're available in 15, depending on where you shop, they're available in 15% of the cases you find. So we're just, and what I'm doing is I'm just cleaning up some of the pulpal floor. Sometimes uh, if there is a bit of a attached stone or denticle, whatever you want to call it, pulp stone, uh, there can be pulpal tissue underneath it, hiding, waiting. All right, so we're going to irrigate out full strength hypochlorite. Let's speed this along here. I irrigate out until this thing is either empty or this is fully clean, all the debris. And we're just going to do one more. You can see it's like continuously, just making sure. Because I've learned that, honestly, you unroof one thing in one second and boom, your whole case changes. In terms of, okay, well now I need to clean and shape that other orifice, that other canal, and increase the, pro increase the probability of success. That's really what we're trying to do, right? I mean, it's one thing to get the patient out of pain and, you know, like, yeah, but it's another to have actually great outcomes. All right, so we're just irrigating here. Now what we're going to do is we should be checking for working length. We're going to read, reconfirm working length with a 10 file, reconfirm patency. And we're close. What I'm doing is I'm just kind of using my Wave on Gold to brush. Irrigate out again, brush the sides of that distal canal, make sure we have all the vital tissue. If there's any vital or necrotic tissue, make sure we've gotten rid of it, make sure it's clean. And what I do here is, okay, so now I'm going to check a working there. I can almost promise you, I'm going to watch, see the bubbles. I'm going to suction back the irrigant in my canal to afford a better, more predictable measurement using my apex locator. So I'm going to place, I'm using the, uh, I started, I've been using the, the uh, AT Airpex for the last year. I love it. And they sent me actually just recently, uh, ooh, can't remember what it's called, the Epex. And this is it here. I've used it. I've compared it to the Merida um, Root ZX2, and it works amazingly well. I love it. It's solid. I can change the volume, like, with a touch of a button. These are the things I look for in life, like a microwave. I just need to start and add 30-second button. With my Apex Locator, I really just need an on button and how to turn the volume up and down. That's about it. So we're reconfirming and working things. You know, often you're it, not so much in this because it's not that curvy, but sometimes in more calcified cases, you will get a shortening of your of your of your canal of your working lengths between the 2507 and the, the finish. Uh, that's common. We're just straightening the canal as we make it bigger. You know, and that's obviously one of the problems with using Wave on Gold. The wave and gold system is that we get a really large orifice, but I'll tell you the efficacy or the safety that I find I have with it um, outweighs that I find. That's my risk. Uh, outweighs the the risk of using it because uh, this is a 1.13 maximum flute diameter, which is about a tenth of a millimeter bigger than if you were to use an 04 taper. So you can see here, I've got debris on the apical part of my flutes. Boom, I know that I've, I've shaped it, we're good. I'm happy, I'm just looking at it. I'm just kind of like, wow, look at that. 
it's working. Same thing again, we've got flute um, debris on the apical portion of my flutes. So essentially, we're not gonna get much cutting with this file, it's more on the apical third. We're just finishing the apical, apical third to a 3506. We've got some debris, bam! That is the best feeling ever. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna finish. I'm gonna make sure what I've learned to do is, and what I've done now is I'll run the file, I'll brush this on the distal canal or large canals. And I'm actually gonna run it two to three times to length on, I'm not worried about um, transporting, no, I'm just thinking, I was putting the word transporting and zipping together. I'm not worried about transporting the, the apical constriction, especially with the you know, reciprocation. It's almost, I mean, studies have shown it, and especially the Journal of Anodontics, it is fairly self-centering. So that's it. I mean, that's cleaning and shaping now. We're done. So we're just gonna go through our, our irrigation protocol, lots of irrigant, you know, the beauty of not being um, sponsored by Dentsply is I can say the good and bad. I love, so I'm gonna use the endo activator. I really, I have used, I'll be honest, I have used the uh, ultrasonic from eight teeth, but I just, I find that this is so simple. It's nylon tip, I just place it in there. Uh, it, what we're doing is we're just activating that irrigant. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna use some Qmix. I don't routinely use Qmix, but in this practice I, they have it, so that's what I'll use, but I normally just use ADTA, full strength hypo, we're gonna run our activator again, and then we're gonna run our Qmix rinse, and then we're gonna try our, our uh, gutta percha points. So gutta percha points are pretty straightforward. They're standardized for this case. It's really quick. Try those, we're gonna fit it in. I'm gonna place my paper points. I'm gonna speed this up. If you wanna see, you know, put in the comments below, if you really want me to go through an obturation video, I totally will. Uh, because I find this fairly boring. Uh, not boring, but it's just like monotonous. It's kind of pretty straightforward. So we're going to place our sealer, but go ahead. I'll, I can redo this in slow time. No problem. If this is helpful. So one of the, and actually, if you want, I can talk about one of the tips. Just because you saw a hand file go down, you saw a rotary file go down. Anyways, the rotary file, what I found out was that these two mesial canals connected. And actually, you know what? Let me talk about this real quick. Uh, so what I found is that my gutter purchase point did not go to length. So I placed, as I, after I tested it, placed my sealer in, it didn't go to length. You can see it, no, no. So I got a percha point, look at it, it's short. And I'm just like, what? So what that tells me, and I didn't use a hand file to connect the two, but that tells me that there's some sort of like little piece of paper debris that goes left and then goes right. It goes left when these, when these two canals join. That's my gut. So what I'm gonna do is I wanna use one of them. So I decided to place it in the mesial lingual. I take my hand, I take my rotary file in one of them to see which one goes to length. And you know, nickel titanium is a lot stiffer than um, gutta percha. So I'll take that to length and then I'll try my, my gutta percha again and watch. Boom. It's just like that. I'm going to pump it a little bit. Then I'll take the mesial lingual. Normally I use the mesial lingual, but in, because it's typically the straighter canal, but in this case, I just decided to, I don't know why use my mesial buckle, and you can see this is seated up. Oh, this is the test as well. So I did one, pull it up, did the other, anyways. You know what I'm talking about. So if you don't, let me know. I can go over that obturation series sequence as well. So we're gonna place our distal or distal gutta percha. I'm gonna place a wedge in there, because it's a little bit, so we don't pull that out. And then we're gonna take our shift shot. Uh, sorry, we're going to take our working length. Yes, this is my x-ray. It turned out terrible, but it gave me the information I needed. Look at this. Um, I angled the the tube head too much. You can see, like, look at the bottom of the mandible, border of the mandible. So I'm happy here because I see our distal canal, but I, I barely see the mesial, so I'm like, eh, let's take another one. Here we go. No, this is a final, actually. That's a final, that's a final. Okay, anyways, uh, there's another radiograph, but in this sense, you can see kind of what's happened. And I saw this little thing right here. So I didn't pay much attention to it because I was like, eh, it's probably just part of the preparation. So we're gonna seal this up. We're gonna go on high speed here. We're just gonna use our, I'm using my eight teeth. I love this. I've been using this for a year, actually. Um, one of the tips that I can tell you is that I, I see how I curve this, I literally bend it in half, I take a, uh, something more stronger than my fingers. I bend it so I can get underneath the MB um, right under here and it kind of gives me better access. 
So we're going to sear that off. We're going to place, this is the, you know, the hydraulic condensation technique uh, taught to me by the internet by Ali Nassay, a great guy. If you haven't seen the video, I um, did a, a Zoom call with him about a year ago. Amazing, super nice guy. So here we are. This is it. So we place, we packed it down, we burnished the gutta percha around the orifices. Um, we're ready. I'm going to remove just a little bit of this, just to make sure there's no pulp, pulp tissue under here, just to make sure. And then that's it. We're going to ready to place a composite in here. And of course I can't bond to zirconia crown. So, um, we're just going to place our composite. So I'm just doing a nice light removal just to make sure there's no like little remnants of pulp tissue underneath that stone. I've been burned before. I've picked them up at the end. So what I'm gonna do here is we're etching the uh, the pulp chamber for our denim bonding agent. We place an orange. Oh, here's where my buddy Magic comes by. He's like, hey, how's it going? I'm like, check this out, man. Look how thick this is. He's like, there's the probe. Look at the thickness from there's three millimeters. It's crazy. And then you can see in the distal angle, look at the thickness there. It's like, I'm hoping, look at how thick that is. I'm hoping, look at it right there. From there to there, amazing. So I'm going to place my dentin bonding agent. I'm going to scrub it all around. We're going to apply it. We're going to blow, air dry it. I did air dry it somewhere there. Yeah, there we go. Just to make sure. Light cure it. And we're going to place our layered inc or incremental layered uh, composite. Just a regular composite. Light cure it. You know the usual. Place the next layer. Boom. Kind of make it nice. I'm just going to take a round burr and just remove all this excess and then that's it. Pretty simple. So as we're watching that, we can slow that down. Take a slow round burr. Here's our final, that's not it. That's So this is the initial and here's our final case. And what happened was, look at this. It's almost like I could feel this in my 10 file that I could feel as I was watch winding down at some point I could feel sort of engaging this but I'm not too concerned about this we had hypo in there for a minimum of 20 minutes it was skinny vital tissue it's probably what I'm thinking is like sclerosed um, pulp tissue that in this area and then our file my files went around it but my hand file dug into it so I'm not too concerned about it but I'd like if you have contradictory thoughts I'd love it for you to place uh, your comments in the below so these this is not, let's see, is this a final? Yeah, this is a final shift shot. You can see it here. So I'm happy with the length. This kind of irritates me, but it is what it is. And here's another final radiograph. Now, stay tuned for another radiograph. So thank you so much to Patrick, awesome guy. Stay tuned for another case where we had a very similar, the same day we had a temporary crown necrotic case. And uh, same thing, a bit calcified. Anyways, thank you so much for staying to this point. I really appreciate it. Uh, place your comments below and we'll talk to you soon. Cheers.